Uh, so more Vortex, and I don't know why, for some reason I thought, I just read an article actually about um, why um, the author thought, that the writer thought that um, Nietzsche would be the philosopher that they want to take on uh, a desert island if they you know, had to take one philosopher onto a desert island and just read them and that would be the only one. So I thought I'd just think about uh, the stream of consciousness thing as to why, um, not necessarily why Nietzsche would be that philosopher for me, but based on a fairly decent reading of Nietzsche's works, just basically what I find interesting about Nietzsche, what I find annoying and difficult about him, and um, yeah, basically that. Uh, so I guess I'll start with the things I like in Nietzsche. I like his prose. I mean, this is often repeated point, but basically the way he writes is very uh, poetic. It's full of allegory. It's full of uh, interesting poetic metaphors, you know, like one must have chaos in oneself to give birth to a dancing star. That's a poetic image. It's, it is image. It, it is very... Um, so I think one of the reasons probably a lot of artists are very drawn to Nietzsche is he talks in these parables, these... Uh, he talks in a very uh, visual way, actually, in a lot of senses. He, they're quite, uh, you know, philosophy with a hammer and all this. And it's quite, it's quite, it, it, it's basically prose that um, makes an image come into your mind and makes, almost makes his, the points he's trying to make as a philosopher very, um, a bit more interesting and artistic, maybe, in some respects, more poetic, like I said before. Um i try and think of another example of that. Um, well, there's many examples of, from Nietzsche where you could you could draw from where he uses this sort of um, um, prose or language in a way that um, is quite visual, maybe, I guess. That's one reason I like Nietzsche. Uh, another reason I like him is because, even though I often I'll disagree with Nietzsche, and there are many things I disagree with Nietzsche on, um, which I'll go into in probably the next part. But even though I disagree with him on things, the fact that he actually gets me thinking and reconsidering uh, quite important philosophical questions like morality, art, you know, the importance of art in the world and culture um, is is what makes him worth reading still. And he's, I mean, he's very, he's probably the most popular and widely read. Uh, of the Continental School of Philosophy. Now, I think probably he's one of the most widely read continental um, philosophers in the contemporary age. Uh, a lot of people would say that's because we, we are in his sort of crisis of meaning, basically. His, his, uh, the crisis that he saw coming with, uh, you know, the, the, the certainties of religious faith disappearing. Uh, we're, we're in that age. I mean, we've, we've had the, I think the death rows of religion in a lot of ways, have been going on for the last, well, I mean, a longer, pre-fifth, post-war, I mean, uh, you could probably make a good argument to say, post the horrors of the Second World War, people just didn't have the same religious sentiment, because they, you know, and I've grown up as a millennial in an era where I can, if I want to, you know, go through a history of the First and the Second World War, I mean, how can we, it's harder to believe in the idea of a loving uh, God or a loving sentient being who uh, provides a sense of order, um, morality and certainty and truth when we've seen what human beings can do to each other, often in the name of religion as well, which is, you know, that's, that's you know, the Catholic Church, I mean, fundamentalist Islam, um, many different forms of uh, um, orthodox religious interpretation have have ended up with you know great evil going great evil actually doing great evil so um uh, Nietzsche's atheism is is usually an entry point for most people into Nietzsche the whole you know God is dead and we have killed him uh um and I mean basically when he was talking about that um that idea it was essentially he was he saw that he foresaw that this this uh the religion's power was waning, and it's power of the collective imagination, and it's power over the um, over human human beings, basically, to 
to di- dictate their affairs and live their lives. Um, then, then, well, then, all that stuff. So then you get the books are future, um, which I find a difficult book. It's uh, it is a powerful piece of writing, but it's it's actually one of the works of Nietzsche's that I find harder to read in a lot of ways. It, it jumps around a lot. It's a lot. It's almost hallucinatory, hallucinatory, hallucinatory in its in the way it's written. Um, most recently, I've been reading uh, *Birth of Tragedy*, which I've not finished yet, so I can't comment on that too much. It's one of his first works, um, essentially where he's talking about uh, the uh, art and tragedy as a concept. From it's a lot of it relates to the Greek uh, Greek ideas of art and culture and how and how we enact a tragedy in uh, in, in a fiction to uh, sort of almost. I mean, this is what I got from it. There might be other interpretations. But the interpretation I got from that, or how I'm getting it from it, is basically that if we enact tragedies and drama and art and music and everything, then it's sort of a collective... Uh, it gives meaning to the world. It gives meaning to the world where there is no other meaning. There's no meaning from God. There's no meaning from... Um, um, and Schopenhauer actually had a very similar point, I believe. I've got to stop now because I've got to pick some sh- So, uh... I think something you could say for Nietzsche that does make him probably a lot more interesting than a lot of other philosophers and philosophy is the fact that you could at least say for his time that Nietzsche was original um, and that he was really doing the work to to find the sparks or sparks of an original idea or ideas. Uh, I think that's certainly... Uh, I think that's certainly true. I mean, he obviously he was uh, somewhat influenced by Schopenhauer, by the Greeks, by the ideas of uh, Dionysus and uh, Apollo. Apollo and Dionysus being the basically it's sort of like they were cults, basically. But essentially, Apollo was more intellect, rationalism, and Dionysus was more cre- uh, chaotic creativity, basically. And Nietzsche went f- was squarely in the Dionysian sort of uh, in the, the Zarathustra um, figure that he tried to develop as an answer to the Uberman, or the Uberman, or whatever you want to, whatever terms you want to use, was uh, the his proposed solution, you know, to create a new morality, a master morality outside of the herd. Uh, Nietzsche is a philosopher, an elitist philosopher in a lot of respects. He was all about, you know, the master morality, and everyone's not equal, um, you have to, I mean, I just think it actually, it, it, sort of, in a way, his philosophy, and this is complete dumbing down of a lot of it, basically, I, I admit that before I even say it, a lot of his sort of philosophy could be really dumbed down to, it's not the destination, but the journey, which is a complete dumbing down, I, I, I would say in that, even as I say the words, but there is something of that to it, it's basically that you have to struggle, you have to... Uh, you have to create your own values, you know, the sort of um, Ubermensch has to create values above and beyond. This is why it basically, this is why Nietzsche's philosophy essentially probably appeals to a lot of disaffected young men who often are very creative as well. And I'm not even going to lie, like, I mean, that, for partly for me, that's why it's appealed to me in the past, because I'm, you know, I'm creative, I... I'm certainly disaffected, I'm introverted and often quite anxious. I mean, I've got a video on my personality big five test, if you want to really watch that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of this can appeal to me. But, I mean, having done more work and, like, researched into, um, you know, history of politics and culture and society, and the work, you know, one must do just as you evolve as a human being in one way or another, just to look into this and form your own opinions. I think politically he's very naive, actually. So this is one aspect. I'll turn more into aspects of Nietzsche that I dislike or you know just think are underdeveloped. His, um, I think his, he had a very uh, dismissive uh, and I think underdeveloped view of um, you know the broadly speaking socialism. He thought there was a last man philosophy, uh, the whole thing in general. Like, and he thought that. Um, he thought it was the, so. The last man basically is this, is this is the counter to the Ubermensch idea. The Ubermensch being the per, you know the person that develops himself of, and develops himself above herd values and you know, the slave morality, or the Christian morality, or whatever you want to call it. 
develops himself beyond those values into something a higher morality or his own self-created morality. Now, the opposite to that would be the last man, from what I understand of the idea. And the last man is basically, he just gets everything provided for him. He doesn't have to do much thinking of his own. He just accepts the morality of the day and the, you know, that's that. So basically, sort of, if you're going to put it in like, uh, I don't know, like D&D <laughs> alignment terms, why not? Like, lawful good, I guess, basically. Whereas the uh, uh, Ubermensch would be sort of like more like, chaotic neutral right so the kid he doesn't necessarily um subscribe to um societal notions of good and evil beyond good and evil the book beyond good and evil goes into that a hell of a lot um, the principal question actually where he get, dives most into this and i read this book uh five years ago beyond good and evil is morality and that's a hard book actually that was actually one of the hardest books in nietzsche um i read beyond good and evil but also one that I got the most from, actually, to be honest. So, uh, I guess I'll talk about, uh, I might as well talk in chronological order, like what I've read. So, first Nietzsche book I read, and I only read it online, was The Antichrist. I think I just found the, you know, I was like an edgy teenager in college. I thought, I think I just found the title interesting. I found it online, a PDF version or an online version. Read the whole thing in college when I was <laughs> Literally, when I was on my lunch break, so I should have been working, I was just reading The Antichrist by Nietzsche. Um, that's essentially a screed against Christianity, why Christianity is a slave slave morality, basically just ripping Christianity a new one, saying why it's so. It's basically a, a, a framework of ideas which basically produces weakness and weak people. Um, that, in a nutshell, is The Antichrist. Um, in some respects, I agree uh i don't quite agree with the amount of callousness but i do think that he has a general point that uh you know sort of religious orthodox moral moral systems aren't are usually uh, you know they i mean you could even probably uh, you can probably even prove this statistically you know generally speaking as a as a given whole population uh, people who are very hardcore into their religion are generally less intelligent than people who are who are not, right? Like atheist or agnostic or whatever. They there is generally there is that, and this can be proved. I'm not just pulling this out of nothing. It can be proved that there is a, a correlation between intelligence and believing in religion. I mean, so it doesn't mean that you, every religious person is stupid. Obviously, that's ridiculous. I you mean, you've had like, great uh, philosophers and scientists who have been religious and more really of it. So I'm not saying that it necessarily makes you, you know, less intelligent. And that would be just... That would be really just absurd to claim that. But, generally, if you look at the actual population distribution of intelligence across uh, believers and non-believers, generally non-believers are smart in one way or the other. Whatever measurement, you know, you can use for that. Um, the next Nietzsche's book I read was, I think I, it was probably the Spoke Zarathustra that I didn't finish it all the first time I read it. I read about, I think about half of it on, the, on a plane actually. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the Spoke Zarathustra. Uh, and I didn't get it at first, honestly. It took me a few years to really understand that book uh, properly and I still get confused by parts of it really to be honest. Um, this is essentially, Zarathustra is basically, like I said, the, it's the exploration of the Ubermensch, the Uberman, and uh, it's his, probably his most well-known book, um, and it's hard, it's hard, it's like parables, basically this figure Zarathustra is essentially a metaphor for this um, Ubermensch idea that he's exploring in there, the concept of it. I actually wrote a piece a while ago, I'll link to it below basically, where I was just analysing what I learned about the, this this idea and um, not refuting it per se, but just saying that I think there are some inherent weaknesses in the idea. I think it's actually, ironically enough, idealistic in the sense that, um, I mean, in some sense when I wrote it, I was in a more pessimistic, nihilistic mind frame than Nietzsche himself, which is which is either an achievement or a great failure, I don't know, but uh, I'll link to that below anyway, because I, I, I think 
Often, of course, Nietzsche gets associated with uh, you know, sort of fascistic, far right sort of ideology. The general, uh, um, you know, that general sort of like um, he gets misinterpreted a lot. Basically, a lot less to do with his sister um, and the, the will to power, which I've not. I've re- I think I read a little bit of that a long time ago, but. Uh, it, basically, his sister just took a, after he died, took a lot of his works, and basically just completely screwed screwed up his uh, reputation for a while. Um, uh, I'm rambling a bit now, actually. So, uh, why did I read? Uh, bloody uh, uh, obviously, Beyond Good and Evil I mentioned before. I've been reading, uh, yeah, so about four Nietzsche books I've read really, and then like selected bits and bobs of like, essays he wrote and stuff. Um, so, uh, one thing, this gets brought up a lot actually with Nietzsche and it's, it is definitely a valid, uh, criticism. Uh, his, his view on women in general is completely, first, which is unusual actually, because for such a, he, in a lot of ways he was a very well-rounded philosopher. He's obviously very well read and, you know, he knew a lot of shit, man. But his view on women is so one-dimensional that it's, it's basically just a, um, obviously, his own bitter resentment towards women, basically. Uh, you know, he basically just says, you know, he's very sexist, basically. Um, you could probably even say in some respects, he's all, well, you could probably argue in some respects, that sometimes he can come off as even misogynistic, but it's more sexism. It's more of a sexism that basically sees women as inferior to men, essentially, without wobbling on for ages. His... His, and this is one bone of contention I have with Nietzsche all the time because it's so, it's so, it's so obviously coming from his own failings, and it's so obviously just him venting and being bitter. It's not him thinking; it's him actually being emotional. I mean, Nietzsche was a sort of emo kid in that respect. He was like, I mean, he had a failure with his friend and Salome and. Basically, basically, he got friend zoned and took it way too hard. Like to just sum it up in just as short a sentence as I can. And I, that friend zoning shit is just like I mean, it's a bollocks concept anyway. Whatever. Like sometimes you're going to be friends with a lass. Sometimes you're going to be shagging. Sometimes you're going to be in a relationship. Whatever. That's fine. And that's just the way it is. But he took it. The guy. The guy took it way too bloody hard, man. And uh, anyway, let's get on to social content, like what he goes on about. He just, he's just, I mean, the, the famous quote that's always brought up of him in reference to women is, is how he like going about a whip. You know, like, you know, you need to look. Basically, he's just. Uh, I'm not providing much content here, obviously, I'm trying to do this off the top, man. But he, he um, yeah, his rants where he sort of starts mentioning women is just a bit. It's just boring to list to read, which is unusual for Nietzsche because Nietzsche in general is, a, is an interesting philosopher and he's interesting to read. But when he starts ranting about women, you're just like, oh, fuck this part for two or three pages. I mean, there's one uh, part in, I think, in, uh, I think, I think it's in possibly um, the book Sarafustia where there's this older woman and she's, but well, the old woman, she's basically talking about women's nature and. But I don't know. He probably should have talked to more women, and, you know, asked them about their experience in their time. But no philosopher's perfect. That is one of Nietzsche's main uh, weaknesses, I guess. In in general, is his is his view of women. Because I mean, let's be real here. Women are not one thing, right? Obviously, you've got and and even if you take his ideas at, at face value, so. Um, so he claims that there's no absolute moral authority, correct? So why then does he have this contradiction in his thinking where he, he sort of like makes moral judgments almost on women in a lot of respects, even though he claims that morality is just something you create for yourself. It's, 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 a, it's a framework that you create for yourself. So why can't, women also create their own morality and this is this is probably an interesting question in regards to the modern age because uh 
obviously the uh, societal expectations that are put on uh, men and women in this age are different they're changing they've evolved and they've changed and we've had what like uh, over what well, all in all 100 years or something more of of feminist discourse and theory which is which has been basically just questioning the place of women in society. This has also changed men's roles as well. Uh, not in a really fundamental way, I mean, just, but basically our roles as, in terms of our gender identity and our gender expression uh, have changed. And I think Nietzsche was just way behind the curve of all that. I mean, I don't, I don't understand why he never saw or even explored further that, um, you know, this idea that, well, if we can, if we can invent new values for our, the way we act in the world, then why wouldn't that apply to gender and, you know, to that as well? I mean, why, why would women just remain one thing? Uh, and, and how, why has he got this very fixed idea of what um, a woman's nature is? Because that's not simple. I mean, obviously, there's biological factors that do come into the way you know, a man, a man's brain or a woman's brain uh, functions neurologically. That's that is true on some level, but it's it's always it's always expressed in uh, different amounts. You know, you can get feminine men, you can get masculine women, and vice versa. And um, in the in the age that we're in now, we're obviously coming to realise that these and. I, Look, I'm not like a so complete social constructivist. I don't think men and role, men and women's, um, the way that we express ourselves in the world is completely socially constructed. I'm not that extreme, but also at the same time, there is some. I mean, like you know, like I'm wearing the colours I'm wearing. I wear a black hoodie and wearing whatever like jeans. None of these things have any real uh, objective gendered. Uh, significance and obviously the way that men or women express themselves in terms of like fashion the external world has is more open now which is fucking brilliant so like if i wanted to go out tomorrow and i don't know i mean even scotland actually but <laughs> it'd be funny if i wanted to go out and wear a dress or a kilt or whatever like if i wanted to do that like some assholes would probably question that but like i've not got any specific desire to do it but if i wanted to the options there for me to do it and People are less likely in more progressive, permissive societies to not give a fuck. Because why should they give a fuck? Because it's just like a piece of clothing that you're using to express yourself. So, yeah, I mean, basically, that was a big ramble. but And it's going to be a big ramble. It's quite good to get all the sort of thoughts on my head like, about all those different things. Um, but, yeah, Nietzsche was way off the mark of that, in my opinion. Um, and I'm just going to go on and on. Basically... Uh, I find, uh, so one of the only philosophers who probably carried on from Nietzsche was Kiron. I've talked about Kiron before, but uh, um, it, he, uh, and I think probably, I think Kiron actually identified that Nietzsche was probably an organic philosopher. So Kiron has this whole idea of abstract versus organic philosophers. Abstract philosophy, I mean, which is essentially like just an older form of uh, the distinction between analytical and continental philosophy in a lot of ways. So, um the analytical, I, I suppose the the easy sort of way to define those differences would be analytical philosophers want to find like an objective sort of logical analysis, not empirical way of understanding the world, uh, the Apollo again, right? Whereas the continentals want to understand the meaning, so the the uh, they're the Dionysian impulse, if you will. Um, now. Just having a little thought here. I don't really understand why these two schools can't talk to each other that much, but apparently that is a problem in <laughs> like more contemporary philosophy of one or the other. I mean, I'm reading Wittgenstein at the minute, like the Logica Tracticus, whatever the fuck, however the fuck you pronounce it. And uh, it's a ridiculously long title. I mean, that's all linguistics and you know, the language games and all this. And maybe there's all game and I don't know, fuck knows really. You lost the game. But, um,. Yeah, I don't know what else to say, really. I haven't rambled enough about um, Nietzsche in general. Um, I think I've had my fill of him, to be honest. Like, I I mean, I might, obviously I might read more in the future if I pick something up, but I think I've read enough uh, 
for um, to understand the key concepts and ideas in his work. Um, I'm saying in this video I've sort of critiqued some of it, and I'm, I'm no Nietzsche. I'm no Nietzsche level philosopher. God damn! I just dip into this. I just dip into philosophy whenever I'm interested, or when I want to, whenever I want to provoke myself to have some interesting thoughts. Uh, I'm not like at the level of a uh, philosophy graduate. I mean, sometimes you know I'll be on Twitter and I'll fall onto a uh, philosophy thread, and it's like these people are speaking another language. Like it's just incomprehensible. In a lot of respects, I think that's actually the problem with modern philosophy that it is too you know, inaccessible and it's developed its own language to the point where it's actually just incoherent. But again, there's something I'd have to research into to actually properly be able to critique that, like sort of on a on a fundamental, actual level. Anyway, but, but basically, I mean, I do think there is something to that sort of idea that it's become too incoherent. It's becoming coherence for the sake of it. Postmodernism might be to blame for that, but who am I to say really? And some postmodern philosophers are quite interesting. Anyway, like Deleuze and Guattari, even though that's like level ten incoherence. It's quite interesting stuff to read at the same time. Uh, Derrida, bloody hell, I never want to read another part of that again. I mean, I've read some of it, and it, some of it's sort of... It's got, there's some idea there, but I don't know if it's the translation from French to English. It's just... I can't even be asked to read it. It's so boring and lead and prose. And just the way... I, anyway, I'm being, like, really just... I'm doing that, my own philosophy with my own little hammer, eh? But um, I'll leave that at that. Nietzsche's worth reading. Read, uh, if you want a good entry point, not the book Horace so I don't think that's the best entry point. I think probably uh, maybe Twilight of the Idols is a good entry point. I've read that one as well. I forgot to mention that. Twilight of the Idols I read when I was in Russia a few years ago. Uh, that's worth reading. That might be a good entry point. It's not too long. It's quite interesting. It's sort of like a good smart ring. I need to read The Gay Science, that's too probably. Which sounds hilarious, right? It sounds like... <laughs> the Gay Science. It's like, what is it? Like, like Freddie Mercury just, like, dancing around, going, oh, I'm going to do a chemistry exam. Ooh. <laughs> the Gay Science. That's not, it's not that literal. I, mean, I, I don't actually know that, what The Gay Science is about because I never read it. Maybe it is about gay guys and gay women doing science. That would be... A, that would probably be more entertaining than what it actually is in real life. <laughs> anyway, that's like quite comic, comedic this turned out actually. But um, like and subscribe if you like the, this this rambling video on uh, Frederick Nietzsche of multiple jokes attempted at least. I mean, it's a funny philosophy. Actually. Anyway, I'm gonna fucking shut up. Bye.